Hello and what is up YouTube? My name is G3Iron and today we are taking a look at the Nerf Radar. Five different things that GGG may look to nerf in the upcoming 3.11 nerf cycle. For those of you who are new to the channel, you can go ahead and like, subscribe, and ding the bell to be notified about more video discussions just like this one. And if you're a veteran of the channel, then you know the way how things work around here. Above my slightly balding forehead, there should be some timestamps placed for your convenience to be able to jump through our different discussion points that we chat about today. And those timestamps are hot linked for you down below in the video description, along with join links to our Discord channel, as well as our Patreon page if you'd like to support us in any way. So the way how these sorts of discussions go when we talk about the Nerf radar is we try to give at least three statements about a particular something that GGG is going to nerf that is presently in this league popular. Then we try to also give some counterpoints, at least three counterpoints, for why GGG should not nerf that very same thing. So we've essentially got arguments for nerfs and we've got arguments against nerfs. That's the format of our discussion today. If you would like to weigh in with any of your own thoughts, feel free to drop us a comment down below. I love reading and interacting with all of the arguments that you all come up with about things that should be or should not be nerfed in upcoming patch cycles. The first thing that is on GGG's nerf radar has got to be stacking cluster notables that were introduced with Delirium League. So why should GGG nerf these stacking cluster notables? And specifically what we mean by stacking cluster notables is we mean using the same notables that you can get on jewels and stacking them across the tree, essentially taking one stat and amplifying it all over the place. Why is it that GGG should nerf this ability that they've introduced in Delirium? Well, the first reason is they simply bring an unintended level of power to players. This was not originally anticipated and this assumption of this argument is that this level of power that we presently have in Delirium League, thanks to stacking cluster notables, was not originally intended by Grinding Gear Games when they designed the various new notables that would be released with Delirium League. Yes, every single league, player power continues to grow, and GGG does a great job of balancing player power with monster power, usually on an every other league cycle. So of course, Delirium League was going to be a big boost for players. We all knew that upon reading patch notes and seeing the development manifesto for Delirium League. But the level of power that stacking these jewels allows you to attain is simply unintended, and it's way more than what that GGG could have intended when originally designing them. A second reason why stacking cluster notables should be nerfed is that rather than creating interesting options, they force dominant linear thinking. In other words, rather than saying, hey, look, there's over 280 new different notables for us to play around with, many players are simply going, hey, what's, what's best out of that? And are just beelining for that. And we see that in the player popularity percentages, whether or not you're checking out the official GGG stats that get released usually about a month into a league, and we've already seen those, or if you're simply checking on a daily basis via PoE Ninja or other sites like that, there is a very real dominant line of thinking that simply goes, what is best about these new stacking cluster jewels? Rather than saying, for instance, well, there's a lot of different ones, let's test them. Players at the moment are simply saying, what's the one single thing that I can do that's the most busted version of these stacking cluster notables? And that's what we're going to do. This would be one reason to nerf them, is that players are simply forced or feel forced into a linear dominant form of thinking. In other words, that there's one or two different stacking cluster notables that are worth stacking and are much more rewarding than other options. A third argument for nerfing stacking cluster jewels would be that they simply trivialize the rest of GGG's balance on the passive tree. When you look at notables that were originally designed, they're not designed to be stacked. Each individual notable on the passive tree generally gives its own unique flavor and own unique twist on a particular type of stat buff for the player. Many times there are risks and rewards. There is give and there is take. With stacking cluster notables, the give is passive points and the take is all the power that there could be. So they trivialize the rest of GGG's balance on the passive tree and they make it so that way players only want to use those stacking cluster notables. And we're seeing that as the league has aged further and further into Delirium League and players have acquired more and more currency to craft, more and more players are simply asking how many passives can you spend on stacking cluster notables rather than seeking some sort of balance between augmentation of cluster jewels along with the regular passive tree. 
Well, why should GGG leave stacking cluster notables alone? We just gave three reasons why they should nerf them, but why should they leave them alone? Well, here's a couple of arguments. One reason would be that the power level was actually potentially originally intended by Grinding Gear Games. 3.9 was a massive monster buff and a redesign to the Atlas. The game simply got a lot more difficult with the introduction of the Atlas of Conquerors, along with the way how Cirrus interacts and the way how the new influence acts and the way how monster health was boosted across the board in 3.9. Players in 3.10 then needed a buff to compensate for the amount of difficulty that was added into the game. This could be the exact intended outcome of Grinding Gear Games design philosophy for 3.10. If players are incredibly powerful, it could be that that's actually the game working as intended, that 3.10 was designed to give power back to the players, specifically through stacking cluster notables. A second reason to leave them alone would be that GGG has designed dozens of unique interactive options with these cluster notables and nothing is forced. Just because there is a meta in a particular league and there are players who are showcasing various builds and various options, every single league there are dozens if not hundreds of builds of capable of taking on end game content and trivializing the game in many different ways. While we're all humans and so of course when we see one player working on something and we see it work really really well we all gravitate towards that, there are also lots of other options besides the dominant meta linear thinking that is presented by stacking cluster notables. Just because you can stack cluster notables on one build and make it very very strong doesn't mean that every other build that could want to stack cluster notables ought to be nerfed as a result of that. There are tons of unique interactions and options that are offered through stacking cluster notables and nerfing them would nerf all of those other builds rather than simply trying to bring player level of power down on one or two particular builds. The third and final reason why GGG should leave stacking cluster notables alone is that stacking notables themselves gives a new way to utilize existing parts of the passive tree. Maybe there are parts of the passive tree that were underutilized or simply underperformed, and now you can use stacking cluster notables to really hone in on something that was rare or something that was out of the way on the passive tree before. Maybe rather than saying this actually trivializes the passive tree, we could actually say this enhances aspects of the passive tree that may otherwise have been unpopular by players or simply left alone or ignored by players altogether. Allowing for stacking notables to exist means that players can min-max on the builds that they want to play rather than being forced into other builds where let's say stacking cluster notables wouldn't be an option. Our second blip on the nerf radar is defensive caps being capped at 90%. So what we're talking about here is elemental resistances capping at 90% and of course physical resistance capping at 90% for physical mitigation. So why should GGG nerf defensive caps? Well first off, this allows players to trivialize some end game content. And it, when we say trivialize, we mean trivialize. Oftentimes players now with tons and tons of investment are absolutely just destroying and ignoring many endgame mechanics that would otherwise instantly kill players. Players with incredibly low effective HP pools are able to simply tank massive otherwise would be dangerous one shots. Typically when GGG sees that us players are getting a bit out of hand with particular mechanics and we're abusing them a bit too much, they typically nerf them in between patch to patch cycles. So expect in some way for defensive caps to be nerfed or changed in some way because 90% simply seems to trivialize too much of the end game content. A second reason for defensive caps getting nerfed would be that players should not be able to reach both top end DPS and top end effective HP levels. By having such high defensive cap rate, it means that players can have lower and lower effective HP pools in order to survive that same difficult content. Rather than having to stack up your effective HP, you simply stack mitigation and away you go. This means that because you don't need to min max on your total effective life pool, that you can put more of your currency towards crafting or towards spending passive points for DPS. So essentially, by having high defensive caps on physical mitigation and on elemental resistances, players can mix both top-end DPS and top-end effective HP levels. This would be one argument why defensive capping needs to be brought even further down, which GGG has done in the past. 
Previously, it used to be up at 95%, then it was brought down to 90%. I wouldn't be shocked if this line of thinking leads grinding gear games to make a decision to bring defensive caps even down another 5%, down to 85%. A third reason for why defensive caps should be nerfed are that player power should augment player skill, not replace player skill. If you've seen any of these builds that simply are capped on their defenses and also have fantastic DPS, you can see that oftentimes players aren't interacting with the game's mechanics. Maybe they're ignoring El Hazamine's mechanics. Maybe they're ignoring Cirrus's mechanics and standing inside his Chaos Cloud. Maybe they're ignoring various boss mechanics and one-shot mechanics from the Shaper or the Elder that otherwise would simply erase top-tier builds. By having such a high defensive cap, oftentimes players are showcasing that they don't have to actually use any of their player skill and the player skill is actually found to be in upgrading their gear not necessarily in actually interacting with mechanics and one argument for lowering the defensive caps that are present in the game would be that player power should augment player skill as you continue to buff your particular build that should help you in conjunction with your player skill but it should not replace player skill well why should ggg leave defensive caps alone and not nerf them well, for starters, players at the top end are always going to be able to trivialize endgame content. This is nothing new. Players at the top end of Path of Exile that acquire tons and tons of currency are always able to showcase a build that is simply able to do something that nobody else ever thought was possible and then do it while going AFK or do it while taking no damage or do it by one-shotting things. We've all seen builds and showcases that can show off the player power and player potential for builds that can take on what is otherwise incredibly difficult content and ignore the mechanics either through defensive layering or through DPS burst. Players at the top end of any action RPG are always going to be able to trivialize endgame content. Just because players can trivialize endgame content in Delirium doesn't mean that defensive caps across the board ought to suffer the penalty for that. A second reason why GGG should leave defensive caps alone is that players should reach any height of power with sufficient investment. While we might argue that players shouldn't be able to reach top tier DPS and top tier effective HP levels when they are combining all of the mechanics available to them, some may actually argue that if you're using all of the currency that's available to you and many of these players are simply dumping multiple mirrors into these builds, you should be able to trivialize the game at that point. If you have reached a certain level of investment on your character where you have truly min-maxed your character, then of course you should be able to reach a height of power that is otherwise unprecedented and that is simply overwhelming to the content in the game. RPGs are essentially power fantasies and if a player can't reach a particular height of power and they are capped and there is always going to be content that is going to be related to the player's skill and not also to the player's itemization or to the player's mechanical usage, then at that point, maybe we ought to reevaluate what Path of Exile is as a genre of game. Maybe it's something different other than an action RPG entirely. Which brings us to our third and final argument. Action RPGs across the board by nature are about improving player power. This starts off from your very first interactions when you first wake up on the beach of Rayclast and you start picking up items and acquiring passive points to build your character out to become more powerful. If you take a character, let's say, that has just killed Merveil, you've just cleared Act 1, and you go back to the very first instance of the game, or maybe the Mudflats, of course your character is going to be able to trivialize that content. Let's expand that example out and say you've taken a character who's recently ascended. You've gotten through Act 3 and you have your first ascendancy point and you go back and you fight the Act 2 boss. Of course the Act 2 boss, the Vol Oversoul, is going to be trivialized in comparison to your character now. Let's expand that even further. You've got a character that can take down Uber Elder and you go back and you try to take down Katava in Act 5. Of course Katava in Act 5 is going to be trivialized by your character that can take on some of the toughest bosses in the game. Your player power has has trivialized aspects of the game that were previously unattainable or previously challenging for you. ARPGs by nature are about improving player power to make previous challenging content irrelevant in the words of the Shaper. And nerfing defensive caps in this regard would actually go against that principle. Our third blip on the radar is impale stacking. Yes, beware those of you who enjoy impale as a mechanic. Why should GGG nerf impale stacking? What are some arguments for why impale stacking needs to be nerfed? Well, first off, impale stacking represents a linear best choice for physical builds. It feels bad if you're doing anything other than using impale stacking when you are playing a physical build. 
It's very simple. You can plug in the numbers and chug away and come to a result that if you are playing a physical based build, you should be using Impale. And then if you're not using Impale, that you're actually intentionally hampering your own ability to take on content, your own ability to deal damage because you're not stacking Impale to the maximum amount. A second reason for why Impale stacking might get nerfed in 3.11 is that Impale forces players to interact with specific parts of the tree. There are some very unique interactions, particularly with the Champion Ascendancy, as well as a few nodes on the tree that are on the southern half of the tree near the Duelist and near the Marauder that are simply best available passives for Impale usage. And if you're going to be playing a physical build, Impale and taking advantage of Impale, it essentially forces you to interact with sections of the tree that that you otherwise wouldn't even pay attention to. In other words, this is forcing you or funneling you into a particular build, into a particular ascendancy, and into a particular part of the tree that you might not otherwise want to play. For instance, maybe you'd want to play an impale build that plays off of the shadow, or maybe you'd want to play a witch that impales. Those are totally opposite ends of the tree that would make it very, very difficult to take advantage of the impale notables that are on the bottom half of the tree near Duelist and Marauder. A third argument for why Impale should be nerfed is that Impale, through opportunity cost, punishes players for not choosing to play Impale. Oh, you're playing a physical build, but you're not taking advantage of Impale? Well, why? You're gimping your own build. You are hampering your own progress. You are hurting your own DPS. You are essentially shooting yourself in the foot by not using Impale. Whenever players feel bad for not taking advantage of a particular mechanic because it's simply better than choosing not to use the mechanic, that kills player choice. And killing player choice in Path of Exile is anathema. Player choice in Path of Exile is one of the big draws in both replay ability for veteran players and draw ability for new players. The fact that you can play nearly anything that you'd ever want to play is a wonderful draw to Path of Exile that not many other games can offer and promise and deliver on. Path of Exile still does deliver on that, oftentimes because when a mechanic crops up and becomes the clearly best choice for playing a particular style of build, it is then nerfed or reworked to allow players more options. Yes, it comes with the sacrifice of that particular mechanic, but it comes with the added blessing of player diversity and build options. To counter all of those arguments, why should GGG leave Impale stacking alone? Maybe you love playing Cyclone and your eyes are filled with terror at this point in time at the arguments just laid before you for nerfing Impale. Well, no worries, my friends. There are reasons why GGG should leave it alone. First off, Impale stacking is PoE min-maxing at its absolute best. Oftentimes in Path of Exile, there are a diverse amount of choices. And when a player makes a particular choice, Path of Exile then rewards that player for investing heavy and heavier into that choice. Being a jack of all trades, master of none, isn't really what Path of Exile build planning is all about. Oftentimes, it's about specialization in one or two particular types of mechanics, whether that's for your offensive abilities or your defensive abilities. In this particular case, it's Impale. Players who choose to take advantage of Impale use a massive amount of their resources available to them, whether that's through itemization, whether that's through the passive tree, whether that's through cluster jewels, whether that's through uniques. Everything a player can think about utilizing to min-max their Impale build are being put to the test and put on display when playing and stacking Impale. This is the representation of what is the best aspects of playing Path of Exile. It's min-maxing at its best. If we nerf Impale stacking, then we're essentially saying it's time for the best aspects of specialization in PoE in this aspect to go the way of the dodo bird. A second reason why GGG should leave Impale stacking alone is that nearly every mechanic has a hot spot on the tree and Impale is not unique in this regard. Sure, there are aspects of the tree where Impale is more prevalent and they happen to be down near the Duelist and the Marauder. But guess what? There's also a whole lot more energy shield on the top half of the tree. A whole lot more spell damage near the Witch and near the Templar. Sure, there's a whole lot of movement speed and bow abilities down near the Ranger. There are hot spots for almost any sort of build you could imagine on the passive tree. It's the nature of having a passive tree in a game. Nearly every single mechanic has a hotspot, and Impale's hotspot happens to be on the southern portion of the tree. If you want to play a build that takes advantage of that, but play it on a character that isn't a duelist or a marauder, okay, so you have to spend a few more passive points to get down there, and you've got to make a decision about whether or not stacking Impale is really that worth it to you.
Not every mechanic needs to be equally diverse and equally represented on the passive tree. There are opportunity costs for spending passive points to reach massive power upgrades. And for some builds, that's worth it. For other builds, it's not. Impale is not unique in this regard and Impale should not be uniquely punished because of that. Well, thirdly, GGG should leave Impale stacking alone because physical conversion affords players alternative options to Impale. If you think that the only options you have if you're playing a physical based build are to play as an Impale stacker, you're just wrong. There's lots of elemental conversion builds that are available to you if you so choose to use so. Impale is not the only viable way to play the game, and it's not even the only way to play physical based builds. There are multiple options for players, and Impale happens to be a very, very strong option at the moment, but it's not the only option. If Impale were to get tweaked or changed in some sort of mechanical way, that might be acceptable, but simply because Impale stacking exists, that's not a problem. Anybody who remembers when Impale was first released as a mechanic, dating all the way back to December of 2018 when Betrayal first came out, Impale was awful. Trying to stack physical damage and make it do anything was simply terrible. Impale is finally in a good spot and there are alternatives if players want to choose another way to play. The fourth blip on the radar today is Pain Attunement. Why should GGG nerf Pain Attunement? Many of you might be wondering, why the heck would you nerf Pain Attunement? Where is this coming from? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, you'll notice that a bunch of players are using Pain Attunement, and that's because the cost of activating this power is incredibly cheap. It essentially takes you one passive point on the passive tree to activate and take advantage of Pain Attunement, and it gives you a massive more multiplier for that one passive point. For a single passive point to give this amount of power is... Not unprecedented in the history of Path of Exile, but it is quite near the top in terms of its rarity and in terms of its power level. For using a single passive point for many builds that are already near that melding side of the tree or the melding wheel on the side of the tree in between the Shadow and the Witch, a lot of builds already pass through there. And so adding a single extra passive point to grab a 30% more multiplier on your spell damage is a massive amount of damage for a very low passive investment cost. Also because it's on the interior side of the tree and not one of the particular notables, it's on the outer rim of the tree. If you're a build that doesn't necessarily want to pass by Pain Attunement already, it's not that many passives to go out of your way since it's relatively close to most starting positions. Granted, if you're a duelist, you're probably not going to take Pain Attunement, but if you're any of the spellcasting natural types of classes, you probably can grab Pain Attunement without too much investment on your part. A second reason to nerf Pain Attunement is that this single node provides more power than many support gems. In terms of passive allocation for power versus skill gems, oftentimes in Path of Exile, a single passive point doesn't represent a larger increase in your damage than a full-on gem slot. Essentially, you're taking something for any build and saying, hey, if you're using a 5 link, you can activate Pain Attunement and pretend to be a 6 link. If you're already on a 6 link, you can make it a pseudo 7 link in terms of its power levels, and so on and so forth. This single node acts like a bigger power boost than many support gems, and for players that are just looking for power, for pure power in their spell builds, Pain Attunement is going to be an option that they're going to want to seek out because of the power level that it provides. Maybe it ought to be nerfed just by a few percentage points to reel it in with some of the lesser powerful support gems. Thirdly, because of its proximity to energy shield scaling on the passive tree, Pain Attunement makes it very, very easy to negate the drawback of Pain Attunement. In order to activate Pain Attunement, you've got to be on low life. Players can easily achieve low life status if they're scaling way more energy shield into their build than they're scaling life. Reaching low life, but scaling a lot of life on your build is going to cost you a lot more in terms of investment and risk if you are trying to take advantage of Pain Attunement while also playing a, a majority-based life build. If you're playing Energy Shield, there's no nerf to it. Maybe make it so that way Pain Attunement requires you to be on low life and you also have a slight reduction to your total amount of Energy Shield just to offset where it's placed on the tree. Or maybe move Pain Attunement from where it's at on the tree to another spot on the tree where it would cost a few more passive points and be a little bit less effective for players who are already naturally scaling Energy Shield so high. Well, those of you who love Pain Attunement, don't worry. We've got a couple of arguments why we should leave it alone. So GGG, here's the first one. 
self-casters need as much help as they can get, and pain attunement provides plenty of help. It provides a big boost of damage, and it doesn't cost too many passive points. It does have the drawback that we've got to be on low life, and that in and of itself is going to be a drawback. Self-casters in their own realm oftentimes throughout the last year have needed buffs and have needed whole patch cycles in order to see some quality of life and some self-casting return back to the meta. Over the last year to year and a half, spellcasters have been in this weird spot where they're either flying through content or they're absolutely gimped going through content. To nerf pain attunement would really take self-casters from a spot of viability, moving through the game, putting them back into that little corner box where we're saying, no, shame on you. You shouldn't be playing self-casting. Go play something better. Secondly, activating low life requires some level of investment in gear beyond the passive tree for players to actually activate pain attunement. If you are going to be scaling up your energy shield, that requires other passives for you to invest in. It requires items for you to invest in. Even using something like a Chevron's, which is by far the most popular spell usage chess piece this particular league for activating pain attunement, even using something like Chevron's still requires a massive amount of investment as a player. It means you can't use another chess piece. It means you're married to using Chevron's. So while you might say, oh, it's a relatively cheap passive cost, yes, sure. We're already in an ES dominated portion of the tree and it only costs us one passive to activate pain attunement but it has a great amount of item cost that is not reliable. Sure, you can use other things like the Coward's Legacy Belt and a few other mechanisms for activating low life all over the place, but the reality is, is those are all means and mechanisms that require you to invest heavily in your character to then spend this one passive point to activate pain attunement. Yes, it might sound like there's only one passive that's required of you in order to get this 30% more multiplier, but there's a whole bunch of other thinking that has to go into your build in order to make sure you're taking advantage of pain attunement all the time. A third reason for why GGG should leave pain attunement alone is simply that it's not meta defining. If you go in and change pain attunement, it is not going to reshape the meta. And if the goal of nerfing pain attunement is to smack down a lot of players who are using pain attunement in order to reach top ends DPS and would otherwise not be reaching the top end of DPS, you're not gonna reshift the meta simply by smacking pain attunement. You could take pain attunement off of many of these builds and they're still going to be clearing wave 20 of Kosis or they're still going to be taking down the Uber Elder or Shaper respectively. It does not matter. Pain attunement is a nice buff for players who want to choose to invest in it, but it's not going to be meta defining and therefore nerfing it isn't going to accomplish the goals that would be set out in the argument to nerf it. So leave it alone. There's no point in breaking something that's working as intended, and there's no point in fixing something that isn't broken. Our fifth and final blip on the nerf radar is the Cirrus the Awakener fight. Well, why should GGG nerf Cirrus? Well, first off, his long spawn time makes learning the fight difficult. For new players who are interacting with Cirrus, almost every single player I interact with on their first fight fails their fight with Cirrus, and then they come away with a sense of failure. Now, this sense of failure might be redeemable if you could say, all right, I'm frustrated by Cirrus, let's go back in and relearn that fight, which you can do with almost every single boss in the game. You can do it with a Ziri, you can do it with a Pale Council, you can do it with the Elder, you can do it with Uber Elder, you can do it with Shaper. Almost every single boss in the entire game allows you to repeat them frequently if you've recently failed them. Cirrus is the lone exception in this regard. If you fail a Cirrus fight, you've got to go and spawn all of your conquerors again in order to then eventually reach Cirrus. The long spawn time in actually reaching Cirrus makes it very, very difficult to learn the fight. So a nerf to Cirrus or a nerf to the long mechanism of actually spawning him maybe early on in the Atlas completion phase would allow more players to engage and interact with Cirrus in a meaningful way. A second reason to nerf Cirrus is that his final phase shouldn't regen as much of his total effective HP as it does. Many of those new players who go through and fight Cirrus the first time when he actually reaches his third and final stage are simply shocked at the amount of damage that they're going to be required to do in this third and final stage of the fight. For some players, this is completely demoralizing. We've actually had a couple of people just straight up say, I'm done playing PoE at this level because this is ridiculous. I never want to fight this boss again. Some players can get 
Cirrus to his final phase and then can't take him down because of the amount of effective HP that is required to be taken down during that last section of the fight. A third reason to nerf Cirrus is that too many of his mechanics cause technical problems like FPS problems or lag problems and therefore his difficulty needs to be addressed in a way that doesn't punish players who might have some FPS and lag issues with the actual fight itself. In other words, if the fight isn't so deadly by missing a couple of frames that you're instantly going to get one shot, then maybe players who have got less than optimized gaming settings are actually able to interact with Cirrus in a more meaningful and enjoyable way. All right, I can already hear a whole bunch of you screaming at me why GGG should leave Cirrus alone, and I personally think he needs to be left alone for the most part. Here's a couple of reasons why. First off, there are plenty of resources to learn the Cirrus fight. You can look up videos, you can go to the wiki, etc. A lot of players, when they play through Path of Exile, are learning not only Path of Exile itself, but also learning all of the tools that are available to them in the Path of Exile community. We're talking about Path of Building, we're talking about YouTube channels, we're talking about forum guides, we're talking about Reddit, we're talking about the wiki. There are a numerous amount of tools that are available to players inside the community that help augment our play of Path of Exile. Since the Cirrus fight itself should represent the pinnacle of play or near the pinnacle of bossing play in Path of Exile, it should also represent to some extent the pinnacle of knowledge in Path of Exile. If you know how to fight Cirrus, it should represent that you've spent time learning that particular fight. Whether that's learning that fight through a long and difficult spawn cycle or learning that fight through videos and wiki, either way, there's lots of resources out there for you to learn Cirrus. And if Cirrus isn't difficult to spawn, then that actually reduces some of the meaning of the fight in and itself. Secondly, phases in Path of Exile bossing are telegraphed mechanics that communicate us players, hey, things are about to change in this fight. It happens all throughout Path of Exile, whether or not it's the Act 2 Vault Oversoul, whether or not it's Hillock, who you fight on the beach, and he activates into a second mode where he gains a little bit more attack speed and where he changes some of the dynamics of his fight when he pulls the sword out of his chest. Phases are telegraphed communication messages from Grinding Gear Games, the developers of Path of Exile, to inform players, hey, Stuff is about to change in this fight. It is a visual communicative message. And when Cirrus enters into that third and final phase, yes, there is a lot of messaging that is going on for players. Hey, stuff is about to get real. It's about to hit the fan. Do you have your brown pants? These are all questions and statements that should be going off in the player's mind as they reach Cirrus in his third and final fight. This isn't a new mechanic that's not present elsewhere in Path of Exile, but rather it is the pinnacle of bossing and therefore in difficulty and substance, it should also be the pinnacle of Path of Exile experience in terms of phased bosses. The third and final phase of Cirrus ought to be difficult because he is the difficult boss and his telegraph phases are to communicate to us that the fight is about to change in level of difficulty once again. If the third phase of Cirrus as the top end boss in Path of Exile at this point in time is trivial, then the whole phasing issue is trivial. There's nothing to communicate here other than to say, hey, slow down and we're going to punish you. Take a few seconds break. The third reason why GGG should leave Cirrus alone is that Cirrus himself doesn't need a nerf. He needs some performance improvements, sure, but not a nerf. Imagine all the players who have got those FPS and lag issues when they're fighting Cirrus if they didn't have those FPS and lag issues. Sure, we can make fun of players and say, yeah, it's natural for players to simply blame dying on lag or FPS. It's as old as an excuse as internet gaming, and let's be honest, it probably existed even before internet gaming. Regardless of that reality, Cirrus himself needs some performance tweaks, and the more players who can access Cirrus and fight him without suffering through FPS lag during his fight, the better. The more players are going to learn to enjoy and take down Cirrus and reap the rewards of that. Cirrus himself doesn't need a nerf. If anything, he needs a performance improvement fix, but not a nerf. Well, thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'd love to hear down below in the comments your own arguments and your own thoughts about what you think Grinding Gear Games will nerf in the 3.11 cycle based on what's going on in Delirium League right now and what should be on Grinding Gear Games' nerf radar moving forward. Thanks again so much for watching, and I hope today is the day a Mirror of Calandra drops for you. Thanks for watching that video. If you'd like more information on any of our discussion points today, you can see them down below in the video description. If you'd also like to join our Discord or support our Patreon, you can do so with the links down below. Thanks again and big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters.